G'day everyone, I'm the Gravetender, and welcome to the other side. In 2002, Insomniac Games published the first of many entries in what would now be considered to be one of the PlayStation's best action-adventure franchises. Set within a fantastical universe featuring robots, aliens, self-centered superheroes, and some very enjoyable gunplay, it told the story of two nobodies who found themselves with a chance to do some real good in the universe. Now 14 years later, gamers everywhere are given their second chance to experience the origin of this story. But is it as professionally written as the first? Does the modern gameplay shine on these worlds rebuilt for the next generation? But most importantly, is there a gun that turns people into animals? Well, let's find out. This is Ratchet and Clank. Deep within a cold, dark prison, the once famous hero Captain Quark receives a new cellmate, who, like many people throughout the galaxy, has heard of the heroic tale of Ratchet and Clank. But Quark, desperate for attention from the first fan he's seen in forever, laments that the galaxy will never know his version of events. His new cellmate is naturally curious, and thus the narrative for this reboot is set in motion. So Quark begins his story on the planet Velden in a small mechanics workshop. Here we meet Ratchet, a young Lombax who dreams of joining the Galactic Rangers, a group of interplanetary heroes dedicated to serving the people and going on adventures all over the galaxy. Yet despite passing a fitness exam which serves as a neat tutorial for new players, Ratchet is soundly rejected. His hopes for ever leaving his home and becoming a hero seems impossible now. That is, until fate intervened. While Ratchet was getting soundly rejected, across the galaxy on the planet Quartu, the evil Chairman Drek plans to build his people a new world by salvaging pieces from other planets. To do this, he begins building his own robot army with the assistance of Dr. Nefarious, a brilliant scientist with a grudge against the Galactic Rangers. Among those robots is a smaller and more intelligent defect who, unlike his cohorts, actually has a conscience. So he escapes the factory in the hopes of warning the galaxy of Drek's impending conquest. Unfortunately, his ship was damaged during his escape, so he ended up crash landing on Velden, where he meets his soon-to-be best friend, Ratchet. Together with Clank's knowledge of Drek's operations and Ratchet's penchant for violence, the two of them set off into the universe, working together with the Galactic Rangers and the great hero Captain Quark to save the galaxy from certain doom. On paper, it sounds like a direct copy of the original game's story. However, there have been some significant changes to the characters that ultimately weaken the narrative as a whole. Most of these issues are due to the game serving as a tie-in for the movie which came out the same year. As a result, the pacing of the narrative is all over the place. One minute you could be working to acquire a new jetpack, and the next you could be participating in a hoverboard race. While moments like these existed in the original game, the tone and pacing of the narrative has resulted in these events losing much of their original weight. The biggest casualty of these changes would be Ratchet and Clank's dynamic. The first game was all about how they became friends and heroes. In the beginning, the two of them simply worked together because they had common cause to, but after the first third, Ratchet abandons Clank's perception of him being heroic in favor of seeking revenge. It's only after he's achieved his revenge that he realizes that innocent people are getting hurt and he decides to start doing the right thing for the right reasons. Clank, meanwhile, was naive due to his robotic nature. He believed simple perceptions of good and evil. Yet when he and Ratchet are betrayed, he becomes disillusioned and struggles to come to terms with this morally grey universe. But once we reach the end of the game, he comes to terms with this and realizes that he and Ratchet's friendship is genuine. The game ends on a positive note, with the story acknowledging that none of this would have been possible if these two polar opposites didn't put aside their personal desires and work together. It was a simple but effective message, one that resonated with players of all ages. However, this conflict of interest simply doesn't exist in the remake. There are hints of it at the start of the game, but any notion of this becoming a prominent theme throughout the story is quickly abandoned in favour of simply making our heroes nice people who immediately become friends and never question each other, ever. Which is disappointing. Part of what makes this series work so well is this back and forth dynamic between Ratchet and Clank. They question each other, debate their actions, and don't just do what they do simply because it's right. They've both been selfish, irresponsible, and at times have desired something more than just being a hero. It's these personal conflicts throughout the series that make both Ratchet and Clank more grounded and interesting characters. Yet at the end of the day, they stay on the path they're on because it's the right thing to do and they support each other no matter what. Next time? Drek has one more target on his list. With Captain Quark now working for the enemy, the Rangers need you more than ever. 
and I would like to offer my assistance in any way possible. Partner. So while the story in the remake is pretty lacklustre, the rest of the game more than makes up for it. For starters, the combat has never been better. You start off the game with your wrench, a nice and simple melee weapon that can be thrown at enemies or used to open up parts of the game world via bonk cranks. As you progress though, you acquire a wide assortment of long range weaponry. From your standard pistols and gloves which toss explosives to missile launches and even a gun which transforms enemies into pixelated versions of themselves. Ratchet and Clank's arsenal is large and extensive, every weapon has their own limits and benefits in certain combat situations. Some weapons might be better for crowd control, while others are best kept in reserve for taking out harder enemies. Learning which weapons work best for certain situations is the key to mastering Ratchet and Clank's combat. As you continue to use your weapons, they will naturally level up, increasing their damage output and unlocking new benefits which can be purchased with Raritanium. A rare resource that is dropped by enemies or found throughout the game world, every weapon has their own distinct upgrades which can be purchased. So it's best to consider how much Raritanium you have and which weapons you use the most before you start purchasing upgrades with it. In the end, it's all about maintaining balance and staying ready for anything. With every world providing its own hazards and offering you a different selection of enemies to deal with, you'll constantly be forced to adapt to whatever comes your way. Thankfully, Ratchet is nimble, and with Clank's numerous upgrades throughout the game, he's given many ways to keep his distance from enemies, or close the gap between them. In the beginning, you must rely solely on your jumping and platforming skills, which, while effective at a distance, in the larger engagements won't be enough to save you. Once Clank is able to fly, it's easier for you to move around the battlefield or flee should you take too much damage. But upon reaching Gaspar, you unlock a more powerful jetpack, which, while only available in certain instances, opens up the levels and provides you with even more space to move around. It's this freedom that enables players to approach a combat situation however they wish. Whether they want to show caution or be insanely aggressive can ultimately be determined by the simplest of factors. But at the end of the day, it's left up to the player to decide how combat is conducted, and thanks to a constant influx of new weapons and gadgets, your options will only grow as time goes on. But while combat with Ratchet is fun and intense, combat with Clank feels more like a slog. Which is quite deliberate, Clank's segments are designed to emphasise how small and helpless he is compared to Ratchet. When faced with larger foes, he has no choice but to run, but when in his own element, he thrives. Since the beginning of this series, Insomniac has been working hard to help Clank stand out from his larger compatriot, with mixed results throughout the series. But it's clear that after a crack in time that they've learned what makes Clank work is when he's given the time to be himself. Whether this be by taking control of other robots, solving puzzles, or simply using his intellect to advance, if Ratchet were the brawn, then Clank would be the brains of the team. Aside from ground combat, there are also multiple instances in which the player is forced to utilize their ship for some aerial combat. These flying segments are usually pretty short, so don't go into them expecting some massive engaging space battle like in Star Wars. Even the later ones are pretty forgettable gameplay-wise. Still, the controls are simple enough that it won't ruin the overall experience or feel like a roadblock. The same could be said for any of the turret segments throughout the game. Of course, unlike the ship battles, you're forced into one spot whenever you need to use a turret, which is made even worse by the fact that you don't have any way of avoiding oncoming damage, aside of course from shooting at whatever's about to kill you. Furthermore, the only really engaging segment with a turret is on the planet Batalia, and that's only because you actually get to shoot some ships out of the sky. Aside from that though, even when the option is there, I'd rather just shoot people with my own guns than use a turret. At least with my own weapons, I'll actually be able to upgrade them. Still, all things considered, the turret sections in the ship battles do a good enough job of breaking up the combat. However, these segments aren't nearly as refined as the hoverboard races. Despite only being featured on two planets, each of these hoverboard tournaments can provide the player with a good challenge and serve as a neat test of skill, especially for some of the later races. Both the controls and the layout of the races themselves are simple to understand, with certain mechanics providing you with an edge should you use them correctly. Like any racing game, timing and careful handling are the key to completing these, especially if you want to earn each of the tournament's secret prizes. But aside from the hoverboard races, there isn't any other form of side content. Much like the original game, this entry in the series is clearly focused on telling a straightforward story with plenty of spectacle, rather than giving us any additional challenges. 
Furthermore, as a remake of the original Ratchet and Clank, a vast majority of the planets and levels are near-perfect recreations of the originals. Only now, with advancements in technology and a more powerful console to take advantage of all this detail, Ratchet and Clank's older worlds simply look stunning. The visuals alone are a testament to how far the series has come, while also commenting on its longevity. It's the perfect mixture of cartoonish visual designs mixed with more realistic lighting and textures. This has allowed the developers to give each of their worlds their own distinct environment and atmosphere, which are all accompanied by their own individual pieces of theme music. They naturally set the tone of these worlds before you come face to face with your first enemy. While the earlier levels usually had a more upbeat soundtrack to them, the later levels usually featured a more epic and nuanced theme, although I won't deny that I would have loved if they brought back some of the music from the original game. What they have in this reboot is alright, but compared to prior games, the music could be a lot better. Still, I'm happy to see that for the most part, the visuals and designs of these worlds hasn't changed from the original game. From where you begin and where you need to go, anyone who's played the first game would be able to find their way around most of the levels pretty easily. Which isn't surprising, the vast majority of the levels in the series usually follow one of three simple designs. Either they have multiple paths to explore, massive areas with numerous mini-bosses, or just one specific route to take. On paper it sounds simple, but this varied world design can often leave the player wondering what they might find when they land on a new world. It really helps you feel like an alien lost in a vast and bizarre galaxy. You don't know what secrets you might find waiting for you. Speaking of which, each level usually has their own secrets hidden throughout. Depending on how each world is designed can ultimately determine how difficult it is to find some of these treasures. Some gold bolts are easy to spot while others are hidden in plain sight. There are many of them to find and they do a good job of encouraging you to revisit old worlds. Among these secrets are hollow cards. Unlike gold bolts, these can be found on both enemies and throughout the galaxy. They serve as a neat callback to past games, showing you the designs of older weapons and gear throughout the series. Whenever you complete a set of cards, you also earn a neat little bonus. So there's clear value to finding them aside from just fan service. But there's also a set of rare Rhino cards hidden throughout the galaxy, and if you find them all, then you unlock everyone's favorite overpowered missile launcher. Of course, it only makes me wonder what idiot decided to put the schematics of the most dangerous weapon in the universe on a set of trading cards. Personally, I hope whoever did that got fired for their incompetence. Still, I won't deny that it was satisfying to see all these old places and people again after so many years. With a fresh coat of paint, the Ratchet & Clank universe has never looked better. These visuals have worked wonders in highlighting the ever-present charm and beauty throughout the game. Even during its most frustrating moments, I never felt as though I was being hindered by the gameplay, rather it was my own skill that needed to be perfected against this sci-fi backdrop. Even after all these years, seeing all these old levels again remade from the ground up with next-gen tech is a delight. I'll never tire of game developers putting in the time to making these old games look breathtaking. I just wish that Ratchet & Clank were a full-blown remaster and not a remake. This new story does hinder your investment in the game at times, but thankfully the combat and platforming are more than enough to keep you engaged despite everything. With a plethora of new and old weapons available, secrets to discover, and some solid platforming, I'm confident that this reimagining will provide you with something to maintain your investment. At least until Rift Apart comes out later this year. Anyway, that's all the time we have for today. I'm the Grave Tender, and thank you for joining me on the other side. Please consider subscribing, and I hope you all have a nice day.